So this uh, lecture, uh, we're going to continue with Enter Back to ACA, and we're going to um, deal with one of the big members of the group, or big pathogens of the group, which is Salmonella. So this is, we revisit those uh, uh, families within the, the, the uh, or those groups within the family, Enter Back to ACA. And in this particular lecture, Salmonella is the big one that we're going to uh, focus on because of course a lot of our time is taken up in particular on the stool bench with salmonella but we have to also speak about edwardsella which is probably one you haven't heard of yet um, but it is actually um, a human pathogen and you have to remember to keep an eye out for that one okay so we'll go through our edwardsella pretty quickly because it is um, just this one little group um, just because it's a little group doesn't mean it's not a significant pathogen. Uh, you have to remember, it's not a common isolate that we get in human um, specimens. And mo for the most part, we would find it in a stool specimen. However, I mean, if it's there, it doesn't belong there. It, it is a pathogen. It is causing a problem and it is reportable. So you've got to take care of it. OK, there are three species uh, in Edwardsella, which we uh, worry about, and that's Edwardsella tarda, uh, Hoshine and uh, Ictalura. Pardon me. Um, essentially, Edwardsella is it's another non-lactose fermenter. It doesn't belong in there. There's no normal amount of Edwardsella that belongs in your colon, um, and it has been associated with several different um, uh, types of infections. Most importantly, gastroenteritis. So, mo for the most part, you're going to be looking for this in stool specimens. That's where we'll most frequently find it. Whenever you have gastroenteritis, of course, there is the capability of that bacteria to penetrate the gut and cause bacteremia, blood, uh, bacteria in the blood. So that is always a possibility, especially in your immunocompromised patients. If their immune system is less compromised, then they don't have the same sort of blocking powers at the gut for all this bacteria. So bacteremia is a definite possibility. In addition, we do have to worry about wound infections, in particular if a patient comes in contact with contaminated water. Um, and pretty much um, since turtles are where we normally find this uh, bug, uh, any water that has turtles in it um, is a potential site of uh, Edwardsella. And for those of you who who maybe have, have gone, like to go out into nature and streams and lakes and all that stuff, Yes, it's much more likely that you'll get an infection, a bacterial infection in uh, stagnant water or still water, like in a lake or a pond. Um, but the water in a stream is not clean. It is cleaner, but it's not clean. So yes, you can get um, Edward Zella or, or any other uh, water bug from moving water as well. Uh, so if you were to go out fishing, um, you know, in a pond or lake or whatever, um, get a cut maybe from the fish hook or something and try and clean it with pond water, always a bad idea. Um, it is possible that you could end up with Edwardsella. We also do see in, in people who have pet turtles. Here's your little guys right here. Um, they don't always stay this small. Um, so it, you definitely have to um, watch out for this. So the normal reservoir for Edwardsella is uh, turtles and the fish that live in these uh, still waters. And then finally, the other disease we have to um, think about, Edward Zell, it's not a common cause of neonatal meningitis, but it is a possible cause. So we do have to, it, there have been cases where it has occurred. Now for lab identification of uh, Edward Zell, the, the key thing that you're looking for is the non-lactose fermenter. Remember, whenever we see a non-lactose fermenter, our hackles should kind of rise up. There aren't that many uh, non-lactose fermenters that belong uh, hanging out in our in our body. We have a few, um, but we always have to be able to prove what they are uh, and to, to say whether or not they belong there. Again, there's no normal amount of Edwardsella in uh, your gut. So if you get this identification, then you know uh, that it uh, that you got to report this. This is a, this is a problem. If you look at the um, at the uh, the rest of the things that we'll see here, 
Edward Zella is an H2S producer, so it is H2S positive um, here. Um, and uh, it is also indole and citrate positive. So here's your indole here. Citrate I didn't write down, but, and it didn't show up, but it, it can usually be uh, citrate positive. Now, one of the things, because the H2S is positive, um, it may, you may have a problem in that you get an erroneous identification of uh, salmonella. So the key there is the indole. Salmonella is not indole positive. Salmonella is indole negative. So make sure that you keep track of those two uh, in order to, um, to be able to differentiate Edwardsella from other stool pathogens. Okay, both Shigella and Salmonella are indole um, negative. So this is a big um, difference. Um, the motility is positive for Edwardsella. Um, as you uh, know, where Salmonella is modal, Shigella is not. Um, so that's another thing you can, another marker you can use to differentiate. And then a couple of other markers that you might want to use um, are the mannitol, which is negative. Both Shigella and Salmonella are positive for mannitol. And the sorbitol, um, uh, same thing, uh, negative, uh, where both the others are, are positive. Um, now there's for, um, oh, the, I'm sorry, this picture down here is an API, um, which as you know, is the manual uh, test method that we use in the laboratory. It allows us to set up all these little tests uh, at the same time, they incubate for the same period of time, and we can interpret them all at once. So this is basically what you're gonna see with Edward Zella Tarda. Uh, one of the things I wanna point out here is that the citrate didn't come out positive. Uh, this is your citrate here. Uh, the citrate didn't come out positive um, it, where it really should have been. Um, but here's your uh, indole here. Um, your glucose is positive here, um, but we don't lactose isn't run on an API, so you would see that on the McConkey plate. The McConkey plate it would be uh, clear pink. It would you you wouldn't see you know it would just be clear on the colonies. But you can see that the indole is positive. You have some weak reactions to LDC, uh, to, to um, lysine and ornithine, um, and then the rest is pretty inert. Your H2S is starting to come up positive here. You have black. Here's your H2S. So you have black. Eh, everything else is kind of boring. Not much else going on. Now for treatment of Edwardsella, um, and remember that the treatment of um, uh, infections of the uh, gut are controversial uh, because most of these infections are self-limiting. But because of the risk of spread to the uh, back to create bacteremia, in particular in an immunocompromised patient, then we have to um, know what treatments that we have. Not all labs will run a sensitivity on a an, um, bacteria isolated from a stool because of really, in most cases, you probably just let the patient get better on their own. Um, but for your immunocompromised patients, i.e. all of your patients, uh, we do want to know what to treat them with um, to see if we can um, hopefully protect them where their own immune system cannot. Um, and so Edward Zella, it's not a common isolate. We do have lots of antibiotics that we can choose to treat for this with. However, there are certain um, antibiotics which are known to be very resistant with Edwardsella, and those are colistin, any of the glycopeptides, uh, lincosamides, uh, the streptogramins, and rifampin. Those are all highly resistant um, for the Edwardsella genus. And so we can even use those to help us if we, if we needed them to. We have plenty of information here, but if we needed to, we could use them for um, helping us identify the organism. Uh, now, salmonella species, this is the big one. This is the one everybody knows about salmonella, um, and yet we still manage to get it all the time. Okay, uh, salmonella, as you know, causes gastroenteritis. Um, it is absolutely never normal flora. There's no normal amount of salmonella that belongs anywhere in your body. So it's another non-lactose fermenter it, um, that you have to keep an eye out when you're looking at stool specimens, okay? 
In most cases, salmonella will produce a gastrointestinal disease. It'll pretty much only inhabit the bowel uh, when it's causing the infection, so it'll, it'll stay pretty localized down here in the bowel. Um, however, uh, it is possible that this particular organism can move from the bowel. Again, in particular, in your very uh, immunocompromised patients. We can get upper um, GI tract uh, specimen uh, 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 infections. Those are much more severe and require usually surgical resection of the infected bowel. So these are things uh, you need to catch this early so that it doesn't spread from the lower bowel into the small intestine. So where do we get this from? Well, the reservoir for salmonella is, um, pardon me, uh, the gastrointestinal tract of animals, especially poultry and cattle, okay? Uh, is it true that humans can be a reservoir? Yes, if, if, if you are an infected person, you can spread salmonella to another person. So that is possible. Um, but the, for the most part, uh, the reservoir really is um, in animals, okay? Um, humans become infected when they eat or drink uh, the organisms in contaminated, usually food products or water. Um, so the, how did the water get contaminated? Um, there's animal poop in it. That's how, okay. Um, probably for the most part in this country, it's contaminated food products that are the culprit. Um, and that would be um, uh, contaminated uh, poultry, including eggs and dairy. Uh, or cattle, uh, any kind of cow uh, product. Now, poultry isn't just chicken. Don't forget your turkeys, your, any of your game animals and things like that. Um, you probably learned in home ec or something like that or from your mom that you have you should eat your um, these things well, uh, well cooked. And the reason is not that it prevents contamination because if the poultry is contaminated, it's contaminated. However, the temperatures that we use to cook meat in are sufficient enough to kill this particular bacterium. You don't need especially high temperatures, so a 350 degree oven will do fine uh, to, to, um, uh, to kill this particular bacterium. Um, there are certain salmonella species that are only found in humans, okay? And those species include salmonella typhi, and Salmonella paratyphi. Those two are not found in animals. So there's our, right, biology, the exception to prove the rule, I guess. Um, Salmonella typhi and paratyphi, which I'm sure you've also heard of before, they cause a different kind of um, a clinical picture, and we will get into that. Um, and they actually, those ones you don't get from a chicken, you get it from another human who has uh, typhoid fever. Now, salmonella has several virulence factors that allow it to uh, produce uh, clinical sim uh, syndromes in humans uh, and also produce more severe, some more severe than others, depending on which of these clinical symptoms they, uh, I'm sorry, these uh, virulence factors that particular strain has. Uh, one that all of them have is uh, called fimbrae, which is a structure. Uh, it allows the bacterium to uh, attach to the intestinal epithelium um, and that allows it to um, create an infection. If a bacteria can't stay in place, it'll just pass through the gut. It needs to be able to attach and the fimbrae of the salmonella enable it or actually enhance its ability to stay in the gut. Some uh, salmonella will also produce enterotoxins. Um, which are secreted toxins um, that work on the gut and cause uh, a loosening of all the gut uh, of the cells, the endothelial lining of the cells. It's very uncomfortable. Basically, you just poop out your gut. It's really unfortunate. Um, and then, of course, because it's a gram negative, um, it also contains lipopolysaccharide or LPS. LPS is another virulence factor that all gram negatives have in common. The virulence factors in general, especially the, the endotoxin, enterotoxins, who has them, who doesn't have them, they're not really um, incredibly well-established. Um, 
we know that uh, salmonella on its own uh, with a toxin or without can cause significant illness. Um, so there, there hasn't been an enormous amount of study um, into the particular strains uh, of, this, um, of this particular genus. Uh, the disease uh, uh, that it can produce, as I uh, talked about before, uh, or as I introduced before, uh, gastroenteritis is the major one, okay? Uh, that's the number one uh, disease that we'll see with uh, salmonella isolates. However, it is not uncommon to get a salmonella from a blood culture, which means it's causing bacteremia. So the, the salmonella spreads from the... Um, it can spread from two places, one from the gut itself, also from a wound. You have to be careful about wounds that have been in contact with contaminated water. Um, so we've seen bacteremia cases in uh, both of those. Um, and also we have enteric fever, which is um, similar like what we see in, in typhus. And we'll get into what that looks like clinically. But an interesting thing about salmonella is that salmonella, some species of salmonella, can produce what we call a carrier state. Uh, a carrier state um, is, is not uh, a normal thing that you would find. Some people are colonized by salmonella, but do not develop any disease. Um, so that means that they can spread the bacteria because they will shed it in their feces, um, but they, so they'll spread the bacteria to other people um, but they don't get sick. So there's no sign that they were ever sick. You, you know, why did this person, you know, why did I get this from, I, uh, from this person? This is uh, only a few um, species of salmonella can produce this carrier state. It's a unique state. It's not that you are, um, you know, having a, a low bacterial load or something like that, but you actually uh, are colonized. It has become part of your normal flora, even though we still don't consider it normal, uh, because you can then pass it on to other people. And this picture is just from the U.S. Uh, the FDA, um, FDA. Little cartoon to tell you, you know, don't drink poop water. Okay, uh, the basic stuff. Uh, treatment again is always controversial with those gastrointestinal infections. Um, if you need uh, treatment, most people, um, I'm sorry, not most people, there is a, a train of thought that thinks just let the infection uh, run itself out because uh, when you treat um, an antibiotic, I'm sorry, a bacteria with an antibiotic, you will tend to enhance the production of the enterotoxin, which will make the disease worse. So um, it, it depends on the people who need uh, the treatment and those would be your most severe cases um, where you need uh, your patients are have the most uh, impaired immune systems so if we go through each of the um, species uh, or the groups I should say um, uh, salmonella uh, there uh, let's do, salmonella itself has a whole bunch of different species just like every other genus um, but instead of multiple species, in the group, in the genus Salmonella, uh, the members are considered, um, th that are considered infectious to warm-blooded animals are grouped into one uh, species, um, which is uh, enter Enterica here. Um, so those, all the subspecies that can infect uh, warm-blooded animals are grouped into one giant species, even though there is quite a bit of difference between them, uh, and that's called enterica. This is just a limited list of what's going on in enterica, okay? Uh, in actuality, there are more than 2,400 serotypes uh, and different subgroups in the, the species enterica. So it's, it's one of those things that it is so much easier for us in the lab to just call it Salmonella enterica. And in many labs, we just say Salmonella species, not typhi, um, because really it's a gastroenteritis, okay? Um, the correct, the really correct way to write it would be Salmonella enterica serotype, whatever the serotype is. So for example, 
uh, you might say, if, if this is the uh, serotype here, you might say Salmonella enterica, serotype indica, okay? Again, many, many labs, most of the labs I've worked at, have just dropped all of that and say, we say Salmonella species. Um, uh, and in some cases, we might say Salmonella species, not typhi, um, just to, you know, rule out that particular nasty bug, okay? Um, uh, the most serious in the in the in that first subgroup that there the subgroup number one actually are the warm-blooded group that can infect humans, and the most serious in that group uh, in the subgroup one is Salmonella typhi, um, as well as a couple of other of its buddies, uh, Salmonella cholerasius and Salmonella paratyphi. And that's because these three here cause enteric fever, okay? Um, and enteric fever is just a whole nother level of um, clinical syn syndrome, uh, much more serious and difficult for our, our patients just to, to get through, in particular, the immunocompromised ones, okay? So this little cartoon over here is just a breakdown um, we can look at all the different subspecies. You can see they're all grouped. You have um, all these different groups, one through five, um, of the oh, where's my pen of the subspecies here. Um, those subspecies are then grouped into cirivars, uh, typhoidal and non-typhoidal, and then the actual form, the, the end form, which is where you would get that um, Salmonella um, enterica subgroup say typhi, whatever it is, okay? Um, and remember that typhoid and paratyphoid, uh, where you get typhoid fever, that only occurs in uh, humans. Now, when we talk about identifying salmonella, um, actually, we have to re revert to serology. It's very important to our identification because all those different serovars rely on our ability to identify the type of O antigen that's present in the LPS. So you remember what LPS says, lipopolysaccharide. It's a component of the gram-negative cell wall. Well, there are a couple of antigens, a few antigens, that we use present on that LPS that we, um, we the, the variations in those antigens are used to help identify which kind of salmonella we have. There are three different antigens. Uh, we have a heat-stable O antigen. We have a heat-labile H antigen and another heat-labile VI antigen, okay? Um, the O antigen, I'm sorry, the O antigen is present in the LPS, yes. That heat labile H antigen is present on the flagella. And then the VI antigen is present on a capsular polysaccharide that's present on uh, some species of salmonella. And so we do serologies. Um, every lab must maintain the salmonella serology sera and anti-sera uh, in order to do not only your testing, but also your controls for um, this for any species that you can think is a salmonella species that you've identified as a salmonella species. Now I'm going to make a little comment here that's important. When you are doing serology, any kind of serology for a bacterium, you have to remember that you have to do it off of a non-inhibitory media. So that means that you cannot do this serology off of any of your enteric media. And the reason is that enteric media, one of their jobs is to inhibit flagellar production. And since the H antigen is a flagellar antigen, then you're gonna have flawed uh, serology. So all of your serology testing must be done off of a non-inhibitory media, which means your blood plate. You have to isolate it to a blood plate so that you could do it off of chocolate too, but you have to isolate it to a non-inhibitory media so that you can do your serologies. Uh, every lab is going to contain, uh, maintain a whole series of uh, sera and anti-sera 
And what you do for this particular process is really you, you create um, a suspension of the bacterium. Um, and you can see uh, in this, this is just a glass slide here, uh, this cartoon here. Uh, this is just a glass slide that we've taken a wax pencil and we've made circles on that uh, slide, two circles, one for our control and one for our um, test. So we've made a suspension. You can see it's a very thick suspension, right? You see how white the suspension is? You just use saline and you just keep putting the bug in there until it's really thick. And then you add the, the, your suspension and your anti sera and you're just looking for agglutination. So here's your positive here. Here's your negative. Okay, no agglutination for the negative and agglutination for the positive. Now this picture only shows you doing it with two, but actually you'll probably end up doing it with many more than that. So we have these, you know, you can just be rotating glass slides uh, over and over again. Um, Now, the, another thing to point about the, the VI antigen, it is found on that capsular uh, polysaccharide. Um, and that capsule is, or that polysaccharide antigen, is only present in Salmonella typhi. So you must keep VI antigen in your lab. And most of us test every, every specimen against VI just to be able to say it's definitely not typhi. We just, you know, sort of a, sort of a habit to, to make sure that we do that. So the, uh, the commercially available anti sera that are that you have to purchase include A, uh, A, B, C1, C2, D, E, and then the VI. Um, almost, uh, or I should say, 95% of the specimens that we isolate in the United States are in that particular group, A through E, um, and actually most of them will be B, um, but some labs maintain more than that, um, just in case um, they, or they want to be really, you know, thorough. Um, if you're, if you react your salmonella against all of those, ser all of your serologies, uh, and you get negative for all of those, you have to send it out uh, for serology testing. And lucky for us, the state does it, so they'll they'll do it for us. If your um, specimen reacts with that VI and it doesn't react with anything else, if it reacts with the VI and something else, in either case, you actually, what you should do is you should boil um, the uh, specimen, you know, your, your suspension, um, and retype it uh, so that you can be sure um, that it's a heat labile uh, situation that you've got going on there. Salmonella typhi, since it's a heat labile antigen, that would disappear um, after you boiled it. Um, so those are the things that you're looking for. A Salmonella typhi would be positive for D and for VI. It would be positive for both of them. Um, so in general, what we report in the laboratory is, because remember I said we switched to just saying Salmonella species. So uh, what we do is we'll say salmonella species, and then we'll say what the serotype is, serotype B, which is the most common, or whatever serotype it ends up being. We don't usually test H antigens at, um, uh, in the, the gen lab, the general micro lab. Micro lab. Uh, we usually send that out to reference labs, and again, the state will do it if they need to. They'll decide if they need to. Um, it's usually the H antigen is more for epidemiology and tracking outbreaks. Now, these serology methods are they're time tested, cheap, easy to do. Um, it does require a lot of QC. So some labs are moving on to use DNA based um, methods where we do sequencing uh, and we can sequence directly for the flagellar and the O antigen um, sequences in order to um, really uh, directly link our isolate with a particular group um, and we don't have to worry about crossover between the antigens or anything like that. Now again, this is just a small group of the, you can see, of all the different species. Uh, and what I'm showing you here are the 
the the um, the actual O group that um, that antigen group uh, that's included, which species are included in that particular O group. So we see paratyphy, there's A and B in there in both O group A and O group B, not a surprise. Um, and you can see all the different, these would be subspecies actually, that belong in, uh, or the serovar, in these different O groups, okay? This is why we just say salmonella species. It really, once you have the O group, it doesn't really matter all the rest of it. Basically, what we're trying to do is rule out typhi, uh, paratyphy, those things, and give the doctor an idea of how serious this particular uh, bug is, okay? Um, and because there's a lot of crossover in antigen testing, uh, as I said, there are some labs that are moving toward uh, the molecular testing. If, you, uh, if the doctor does require the exact serovar, then in most cases, we'll probably send that out for reference testing because we'll want the H uh, antigen. Um, and those, those tests um, are done by reference labs, okay? So you would need to have that H antigen in that case. Okay, but before you get to the serology, you have to have identified it as a salmonella species. So um, what are the biochemical reactions that we're going to worry about in, for this particular group? Um, and again, the biochemical reactions are also going to help us rule out typhi uh, as well. Remember, you're gonna find this on your enteric me media, okay? It is a non-lactose fermenter, um, as those gut pathogens are, okay? We have to watch out for those non-lactose fermenters, and it is an H2S producer. For the most part, we can identify um, salmonella on either API or automated, they, uh, any automated, you know, like uh, microscan, biotech, they work wonderfully to be able to identify salmonella. If we look on our, our plates, uh, on the left here, we have a McConkie plate, and you can see uh, you have a non-lactose fermenter here. You see no color, it's just picking up the color from the plate. Actually, I think this is an XLD auger. Um, so you can see it's just picking up the color from the plate. And here on your HE auger, um, very commonly used in your enterics, uh, you can see that the salmonella is likely going to be this black uh, colony here, okay? Um, yes, there is a green colony on this plate, um, but that green colony is not likely to be salmonella since the green one's not producing H2S and salmonella does produce H2S, okay? So once you get your identification um, and you're gonna look at it, to be able to differentiate between enteritidis and typhi, what are the, some of the things that you're gonna see? Well, in your basic tubes, um, typhi doesn't tend to produce gas. So that's in your, um, uh, this is, uh, TSA is also the same as TSI, uh, triple sugar. This is your triple sugar agar. So this is the one uh, where enter salmonella does produce gas, um, but typhi tends not to produce gas. Okay, now that's not gonna be your end all. Instead, what you're gonna go down to is your citrate. You can see the citrate for typhi is negative, uh, for enteritidis is uh, positive. And then if you go down even farther to your enzymes, your arginine and your ornithine, uh, both positive and enteritidis negative in typhi. And then some sugars, your arabinose and your raminose, positive and enteritidis negative in typhi, okay? These are the things, these are, these are the biochemicals that either your API or your whatever it is, Microscan, Vitec, Phoenix, whatever it is, is going to use in order to differentiate between these two uh, groups. If you don't have that, if, you only, if your uh, particular library only reports to species level, then you need to start looking at these. These biochemicals are present on both of these machines. Look at them to be able to differentiate. And then go to your then you go to your serology, okay. Okay, so what kind of disease does Salmonella uh, create? Well, gastroenteritis is probably the one that we're most uh, familiar with. Uh, gastroenteritis is frequently referred to as food poisoning, although um, it's not that's not technically, I suppose, true. Um, but it doesn't really matter. The end result is you're gonna be sick as a dog, okay? Um, 
what you're going to get is diarrhea, um, and it can be caused by any of number of serotypes, uh, including uh, ty uh, typhimurium, uh, enteritidis. Uh, the most uh, enteritidis is still the most uh, common. Okay, so you can get it uh, from either one of those, um, and for the most part in the United States, we get um, this infection uh, by um, either coming in contact with or eating uh, contaminated animal products um, or still in the same way coming in contact with contaminated cooking surfaces. So let's say you're a vegetarian, you might say, well, I never have to worry about um, salmonella, except that you do, um, because first of all, um, is your food prepared in a kitchen that uses that still prepares poultry? And did somebody chop your salad on a cooking, you know, on a on a chopping uh, block that they just cleaned the chicken on? Also, um, was the were the vegetables that you're growing watered with unfiltered water? Uh, so using some kind of natural water reservoir. Um, it's another source of salmonella. So it is possible. You, it's not like vegetarians never have to think about this. Okay. Now, most infections uh, with gastroenteritis are limited to the mucosa and submucosa of the uh, GI tract. Um, symptoms are going to appear um, somewhere between 8 and 36 hours after ingestion of contaminated food, and those symptoms include, uh, obviously, nausea and vomiting. Uh, there probably will be a fever, uh, that's thanks to the LPS, chills, abdominal cramps, and watery diarrhea. Most cases are self-limiting, and we uh, teach that antibiotic treatment is contraindicated for gastroenteritis. And that's because it's self-limiting, okay? Um, it, because it usually does stay in the mucosa and the submucosa, um, it is believed that the treatment will prolong the carrier state. Um, we also don't want to give like anti-diarrheal drugs or anything like that, since they'll also uh, encourage the adherence of the bacteria um, the, where the antibacterials will actually encourage a carrier state the anti-diarrheals may actually encourage um, further invasion into the epithelial, uh, into the uh, GI tract and potentially into the bloodstream. So uh, for the most part, we wanna make sure that we give the patient supportive therapy. So lots of fluids to prevent dehydration. Um, you know, the BRAT diet, uh, very easy on the, if you're gonna eat anything. Um, and then they should be able to get through it on their own. That presumes a normal immune system. Um, unfortunately, your patients don't have a normal immune system. So treatment is probably gonna be more uh, likely for those patients since uh, we, you know, penetration into the bloodstream is much more likely. So if dissemination does occur, uh, the antibiotics of choice are chloramphenicol um, or, or ampicillin but you will have to perform sensitivities in that case since, of course, we, we can always see resistance emerging, okay? Um, but if you're doing a salmon, uh, salmonella species, you wanna make sure that you include the ampicillin and the chloramphenicol in the report since those are our drugs of choice at this point. Uh, we don't see a ton of resistance yet, okay? And again, this is just a little cartoon showing you how the bacteria actually can penetrate through uh, the gut. So if for the most part, the bacteria does say, stay out here in the mucosa submucosa, um, but if you force it, it can actually uh, penetrate through the endothelial lining and penetrate into the lymphatics and then the bloodstream, okay? So bacteremia, I have, uh, you know, most uh, microbiologists who've been at it for a while have gotten a salmonella or two from the blood uh, or a body fluid, like a like a PD fluid or something like that. And for the most part, it gets there by spreading from the GI tract, okay? Um, occasionally from a wound, but mostly from the GI tract. The species that usually, that are more likely to disseminate to the blood are cholerasis and Dublin, okay? Um, 
it is possible for any serotype to penetrate the gut, in particular in an immunocompromised patient. However, these two are much more likely uh, to do it. And usually uh, the people we see this in are in little kids who are young children who are at least immuno, uh, you know, weak immune systems um, or the other or other people who are immunocompromised, i.e. all of your patients. OK, and what you'll see with these um, uh, patients, obviously the fever that would be associated with bacteremia, but you'll also probably see those GI symptoms, the diarrhea and the stomach, the vomiting and the nausea. Uh, you'll probably see that as well. OK, the bacteremia in this case usually occurs kind of in, in episodes, uh, which is just based on the fact that when bacteria is growing in the blood, it'll tend to grow in waves. It doesn't grow necessarily consistently. And so it'll um, sort of really, uh, the population will really go crazy. And then the immune system, what, what there is of it, will try to tamp it down. And so you'll see the fever going up and down uh, over time, okay? The GI symptoms uh, associated with, bacter with bacteremia are much more likely in kids than they are in adults. In adults, you, you may or may not see those GI symptoms. So sometimes this salmonella can come as a complete surprise, okay? Um, uh, if your lab does perform uh, sensitivities on, uh, on a salmonella from a stool source, uh, the thought may be if your lab decides to do that, uh, that, well, we're going to do the sensitivity on the salmonella from the stool source just in case it does penetrate the gut and become bacteremia. Then you, then you would already have a, a, an idea of what the MIC is. Now, you wouldn't necessarily know the exact MIC because um, uh, the, the organisms that penetrate the gut are not necessarily, the sensitivity of them is not necessarily reflective of the entire population that's living in the, in the um, bowel. It's only going to be a few organisms that are able to penetrate the gut most likely. And so those organisms likely have a slightly different um, MIC uh, profile or sensitivity profile. Um, however, uh, the medical directors um, have to work with the, as much information as they can get. So some hospitals do choose to do a sensitivity on uh, salmonels that they isolate from the gut, just sort of as a head start and in case, okay? And still, the antibiotics of choice are the same, chloramphenicol and ampicillin. We still need to see those, okay? And what we see here, um, the cases where we see um, uh, uh, salmonella, um, you could see the blood test that we see. The patient is going to probably have some pretty severe anemia. Um, these are some, if the, I'm sorry, if they have severe anemia, if they have a low CD4 count, if they're HIV positive, for example, um, if they have splenomegaly or hepatomegaly, um, those are all cases. In all these cases here, you are by definition immunocompromised. Um, the symptoms that you'll see in these patients, fever, um, potentially a cough, uh, potentially diarrhea. Okay, enteric fever. Uh, enteric fever, what is enteric fever? This is something um, a lot of people think, oh, enteric fever, that's from, you know, that's from the Renaissance time or from, you know, Emily Dickinson's time. I don't have to worry about enteric fever anymore. Uh, I beg to differ. Enteric fever, uh, although it's certainly more treatable and less, um, doesn't cause these great epidemics as much as it used to. The reality is enteric fever is where your patient has a prolonged fever, uh, weeks to months. Uh, well, hopefully we'll get to it before it's months. They do have bacteremia and there's also RES involvement, RES standing for reticuloendothelial system. So that would include the liver, the spleen and the intestines, okay? So what you have with enteric fever is the organism has disseminated not just from the gut to the blood, but to multiple organisms, uh, I'm sorry, multiple organs. And this is the, the particular serotypes that are able to do this include typhi, paratyphi, and choleraceus. Um, these three are um, much more likely to 
uh, to generate uh, enteric fever than uh, those other serotypes uh, are, those other serovars. You can see that the pathway uh, that occurs with um, enteric fever starts still in the same place, ingestion, okay? It's a fecal oral bug. And you may think, well, how could this possibly happen? You have to eat enough. It's not just one bug that you've eaten. You've taken in enough of that bug to make it through the gastric acidity. And that can happen uh, in two ways. Either you've really taken on a very high bacterial load or your gastric acidity has uh, come so close to norm, uh, to, to neutral, you know, it's, it's the pH has risen in your stomach, so it's not gonna kill the bacteria anymore, okay? In any case, the bug makes it to the small intestine where multiplication can occur, it'll penetrate the mucosa, and in the case of dissemination, uh, it gets to the lymphatics in the intestine, through the thoracic duct, and so on through, down the line. Okay, um, and you can see you can start to get into a bit of a loop here. Now typhoid fever, um, uh, which is specifically caused by both typhi and paratyphi, um, uh, uh, paratyphi has a similar manifestation to uh, salmonella typhi. Um, but Salmonella typhi has, is more severe, okay? Now, both of these species, typhi and Salmonella typhi, uh, um, paratyphi, these ones don't have a known animal reservoir. These are passed either through food or water that has to have been contaminated by a sick human, okay? This is not a case where you've been too close to the farm, okay? You've been too close to a sick human in this case. Um, outbreaks are more most frequently caused by improper disposable, disposal or overwhelming of the sewage or, or some kind of poor sanitation, maybe even no sanitation. So when you think about your travels, if you're going to a country where either water's not treated routinely um, or where um, the sewer systems, the, the you know, uh, sanitary systems are less than ideal, um, you're, more likely uh, you're at higher risk for either of these. The incubation period is, is shorter for typhoid fever. You can see nine to 14 days uh, and you're gonna start to see some symptoms um, for, the, um, for this. Um, and the, uh, when we talk about typhi and paratyphi, it's um, carriers, these are both uh, capable of producing a carrier status in a person and if your carrier happens to be a food handler, um, that's a big problem. And that's an important source of infection, both historically and currently. Ugh. Now the symptoms for uh, typhoid fever include fever, uh, malaise, anorexia, lethargy, uh, myalgia, and headache, okay? Um, these, uh, they're kind of, it's, it's kind of, um, a nondescript, I'll say. Um, however, uh, there are some, uh, there are a couple of things that definitely stand out. The fever, certainly. Um, these particular organisms um, are capable of um, producing this particular um, system of the symptom here, uh, which is called uh, rose spots, okay? This kind of rash that's associated with typhoid fever, okay? And basically what happens is you take in the, um, the bug, okay? And these two serovars are resistant to the acids in your stomach. So it takes a lot less in order to get sick, okay? They make it their way through the stomach uh, and into the small intestine where they'll be able to invade and penetrate uh, the mucosa there. Um, and once they penetrate it, they can make their way to the lymphatics um, and infect the lymphatics. From the lymphatics, they can go to the bloodstream, spleen, liver, even the bone marrow, okay? Uh, once they're in the bone marrow, they become engulfed by monocytes 
and they start to multiply inside those monocytes. Um, and then they can be released later in the bloodstream again, okay, uh, where they can then make their way through the liver to the gallbladder, through the pyrus patches of the intestines, and you get um, eventually uh, you get these rose spots, the, the rash um, that's um, present, which is characteristic of typhoid fever. Um, and also you're going to see some pretty uh, nasty uh, bowel um, results. Uh, these two are capable of causing necrosis of the intestine. So that's not just a, um, a self-limiting infection. That's a serious problem. You're going to have to remove uh, that part of the of the intestine. Uh, you can see perforation of the bowel. You can see meningitis. You can see osteomyelitis, endocarditis, and abscesses. Uh, you can see all of these. So this these bugs are, are like sort of salmonella on steroids. They're they're particularly um, uh, particularly virulent uh, in the human uh, system. Okay. Now. For these two, we definitely do want to have a sensitivity because this is a much more far-reaching uh, organism. And so the um, antibiotics that we're going to use to treat uh, an enteric fever like this, typhoid fever, we're going to use quinolones. Uh, we can still use the chloramphenicol, and we're probably going to use the cephalosporin as well. Okay. Um, and frequently when you're talking about a, a, a disease as serious as this, you'll probably use more than one of those. The doctor might want more than one of those. So with these two um, serovars, you definitely want to have a, um, a sensitivity done. And then finally, let's talk about our carrier state and the most um, famous of our carriers, typhoid Mary. Remember, a carrier um, is a person who, um, while they're not ill, they may have been ill at one point, but they actually recovered but the organism hangs out uh, in their body, most frequently in their gallbladder. That's usually um, the place that salmonella likes to hang out the most. Um, and so they end up being a chronic uh, carrier. They will uh, excrete the organism in their stool. Um, and this particular organism becomes very difficult to kill with routine hand washing. So typhoid Mary, you know, she wasn't necessarily not washing her hands. Um, it's just that the, the washing that she was able to do, it was not um, as effective um, as um, hand washing for other um, organisms. This organism's got um, all kinds of cholesterol that it can, um, you know, shore up its capsule with and prevent uh, the soap that you use from really working very well. Um, and so typhoid Mary was a real person. Um, no matter what she, or, or I should say, she was a carrier to the end of her life. Uh, antibiotics do not work uh, on uh, carriers, in particular because the antibiotics don't really reach an achievable level in the gallbladder. Um, if a person were to become a carrier today, we would probably remove their gallbladder, gallbladder um, and try to stop the carrier state that way. Um, but Mary was a, a cook. Um, she, she was born on September 23rd, 1869, passed away in, uh, on November uh, 11th, 1938. And actually, she was the very first person in the United States to be identified as a carrier, of, a healthy carrier of typhoid fever. Um, and her um, claim to fame was actually, she was an, an excellent cook. She was a fabulous cook. Okay, and this is kind of why she became infamous, I, I suppose, because um, people who hired cooks were rich people, right? Rich people hire cooks. So the rich people would hire Mary as a cook because she's an excellent cook. And Mary couldn't get rid of the typhoid on her hands. So the salmonella ended up in the food and the people that she was infecting were wealthy people. So it was a question of, well, how do these wealthy people come down with salmonella? Um, it is known, if, uh, or it has been proven, that she infected 53 people in her lifetime, in her career as a cook. Three of those died uh, from the disease. And probably the, her, the reason she became 
so notorious, poor Mary Malone, um, is her stubbornness. I mean, she's not a Malone for nothing. Uh, she actually um, had vehement denial of her own role in spreading the disease. Um, and she refused to stop working as a cook. She would like cha change her, you know, use a different name um, and then go get a job as a cook somewhere else. She was a really good cook. I mean, she did, it's not like women had a lot of other choices to support themselves in those days. Um, but she ended up being forcibly quarantined twice by public health authorities. Um, the first time after they let her um, go with the assurances that she said she wouldn't do it again, she went and got another job and more people got sick because she was she felt fine. It was her misunderstanding of how the disease worked. The second time she was quarantined, she was quarantined uh, until she died in, uh, uh, um, you know, by old age. She didn't die of anything crazy. In 1938, she passed away. Um, so uh, it is possible that Mary was born with the disease. Uh, her mother is known to have had typhoid fever during her pregnancy. So that might also be part of why she was such a robust carrier um, without any, um, you know, um, signs to herself. So she probably may, or she may have carried this since she was um, a child, uh, you know, an infant. Um, and it was only um, when she came in contact with other people's food as a cook, which she wouldn't have been hired until she was an adult, um, that her notoriety started, okay? But it, one of the things that's important to note here is that Mary didn't break any laws. Uh, Mary didn't um, do anything, you know, wrong, uh, but she was kept in quarantine, um, She, which means she was basically imprisoned. Um, it what, didn't have bars on the doors, but she wasn't allowed to leave um, for the rest of her life uh, because she, would refu she refused to um, stop working as a cook.